All right. Welcome, everybody. And we have a very special guest with us today, Rachel Blanton Walker. Um, I will, because I feel like I'm usually so bad at introducing people, um, I will just kind of allow you, Rachel, to just bring yourself in, um, say what you do, uh, where you're from, and um, what what you, I guess, are just super interested in right now. Doesn't have to be theology because I know I know it's theology based, but doesn't have to be. Uh, okay. Any- okay. Oh. Sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, well, my name is Rachel Blanton Walker, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I am by trade a grant writer, and so I have been writing grants in the faith-based space and helping smaller, you know, nonprofit, faith-based nonprofit organizations to um, to reach their revenue goals. And so I found it to be really fulfilling. Um, it has been a great blend of a theology background and a professional background. Um, and so I've been really enjoying it. Um, I just finished my MTS at seminary. So I went to McAfee School of Theology here in Atlanta. Um, and my focus was really on systematic theology. Um, and I, my, my thesis was on more or less uh, Trinitarian doctrine um, and the state of Trinitarian doctrine as of today. Um, and what I'm really interested in right now. So I graduated in May, which wasn't too long ago. So I've been taking a bit of an intentional break, um, from producing any sort of theology content. Um, and I have been honestly, uh, in the meantime, you know, dabbling in theology a little bit, but, um, but really looking into sort of, uh, feminist theory and praxis, which I did long, long ago. And so I'm returning to it a little bit for just, I don't know, a bit of a breather. Okay. Um, so you said dissertation. So I'm curious, how how over it are you with Trinitarian <laughs> thought at this point? Uh, are you, um, yeah, are you just like exhausted by the topic at this point? I don't know how long you spent on the topic and everything else. Yeah, well, you know, I I wrote on it for about two years, so it was pretty extensive. And now I'm kind of at a point where I'm, yeah, I'm sick looking at it, but I'm also like, well, maybe, you know, I could probably continue with this and turn it into something that's the length of a book or um, or take it on to a PhD at some point. Um, but oh my gosh, I need a bit of a break. Um, I'm still really interested in Trinitarian doctrine. It's something that, um, it is, it's in a a weird space. So as Christians, we all just accept the Trinity. Um, but Trinitarian doctrine itself can get really abstract. And I think that that puts it in the realm of almost inaccessibility for some folks. They just, they just want to accept it at face value and, and kind of just leave it as is. But um, over the centuries, there has been much debate over what the Trinity looks like, um, even though the Trinity was solidified during the Council of Nicaea. Um, there has been debate after debate after debate as to what it looks like, what the relationship of the Father is to the Son, is to the Spirit, etc. cetera. Um, and so Trinitarian doctrine has, since probably the 70s, sort of been coming into a renaissance of thought of how we consider it in relation. Um, So looking at what the Trinity is in active relation, in communion, what that means for humanity, how the Trinity envelops humanity in addition to being in relation with the persons of the Trinity. So... um, you know, I'm, I'm still endlessly fascinated by it because, you know, at, at face value, like I said, it's very abstract and, you know, might maybe numeric. Um, but really at the heart of Trinitarian doctrine is this deeply personal um, theological experience. Okay. So it, it's a... Uh... I mean, I, I mean, I, I have to know it's probably more than this. I mean, it's more than debating the order of the Trinity, right? <laughs> um, okay, so you were, yeah, that's something that, that that is true. Like we we take that as a given, 
um, as Christians. And I can imagine that even beginning to like question a lot of it um, can be probably uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, what, what was a, what was some of the thinkers that kind of helped you think through uh, the dissertation um, and, and the Trinity kind of stuff? Or were there some of the thinkers, uh, I would say, uh, maybe that are even like your favorite, you know, that you just really like that just, you know, you're like, oh, that's really interesting. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I highlighted um, sort of a spectrum in, uh, in the thesis. And so, I want to start out with um, the evangelical side of things. So uh, modern evangelical thought has this understanding of the Trinity, which is called, they don't call it this, but everyone else does, <laughs> functional subordinationism, which is essentially a chain of command from the Godhead. The Son is obedient to the Godhead, and, um, and then the Spirit is obedient to the Son. And so it creates this hierarchical system. Um, and so thinkers like Wayne Grudem um, and George W. Knight the third, and then you can go back to Charles Hodge and all sorts of other um, male evangelical thinkers who have taken this idea of a subordinate son and mirrored it to what a proper Christian marriage should look like. So that means that the wife is eternally subordinate to the husband. And so they've mirrored this. And so th this is a really interesting way of looking at things because it sets up sort of this, um, this domination and subordination, not only within God, but reflected out to be proper in human relationships. And so what I did in my thesis was I took this sort of at, at a broader scope and said, you know, here's the rise of this evangelical thought, here's the societal implications. And I specifically took the overturning of Roe v. Wade as a prime example of how this understanding of a dominating God um, reflects out into how we dominate others in society. So that is sort of one pillar of thought um, that I don't, just to put this out there, I don't agree with it, um, but I'm using it sort of as the, you know, as the counter example, right? And then so moving forward to thinkers from, like I mentioned about the 70s, 80s um, through today, um, individuals like Jürgen Moltmann, um, Catherine Lacuna, Elizabeth Johnson, um, and, and then there's others beyond that too. Um, but they really have this understanding of the Trinity. Um, it, it's a perichoretic relationship, which means it's this inner dwelling of three persons. So they cannot be distinct without the others. And so it creates this sort of, um, you know, you could think of it almost as like a, as a Venn diagram, right? Except with, with one additional circle attached to it so that they are all completely interdependent upon each other. And then additional to that um, is the Eastern Orthodox thought. And so I use um, John Zizioulis. He wrote a book called Being as Communion. Um, and so his understanding of the Trinity is very similar. It is based on, you know, this idea of ecstasy. It's, it's in communion. It's this active relationship. And God is the communing, the relationship aspect of it. And that's it. Um, and so it, it, it makes more sense it because this relational trinity we it's a mirror for human relations and how we act within the world and how we treat each other and so would you rather have an egalitarian communitarian sort of existence or in your partnerships in society etc or would you rather have a dominating factor and and subordinates below that um which then you know, I mean, this idea, that dominating idea proliferates racism, you know, sexism, xenophobia, et cetera. Um, because I had mentioned Charles Hodge earlier as one of the evangelical thinkers, in addition to his belief of, of the son being subordinate to the father, you know, he used this to uphold chattel slavery as well. So it has really, the way you consider the Trinity has really, like far reaching reverberations for human life. Wow. Yes. So it's it's almost like uh 
th this is the part that I feel because you said like uh, thinking through these tr trinitarian systems kind of reflect on society. Um, it's almost like sometimes we can be doing it the 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 wrong way. Like it, it's almost seeming to suggest we need to be thinking about society first and then trinitarian like it, it, it's it's weird like I, I, uh, hopefully you understand what i'm trying to say it's almost like as if because it seems like the trap was thinking trinitarian first but then if we don't understand how it links to society um then it can have really bad repercussions um and i guess what i'm seeming to suggest is like it's almost like I don't know. I, I have, I'll be curious about your opinion on this. It's almost like if we think society first, then we can probably get a an interesting trinitarian system here um, that would link with society. Um, but then, the, but then this raises this question for me. It's like um, theology and society. Um, I don't know. Is is there an order to think in first? You know, do we think society first, then theology, or do we try to think theology in a sort of in in reference to society in context? It almost seems like I feel like that's probably what you're trying to suggest that there is consequences. This is not just an abstract experiment of trying to understand the Trinity. It legitimately has social uh and actions and encounters that can be harmful in, in the world. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah, no, I think um, I think you're definitely on to something. I, I want to highlight two theologians here, um, Jürgen Moltmann and then Pierre Tehard de Chardin. Um, both of them had wartime experience. So Moltmann was a prisoner of war. Um, and Tehard was a stretcher bearer during World War I. So um, both men went on to be, uh, in my eyes, very great theologians. Um, but before that, uh, they experienced, you know, I mean, the reality of war um, and were victims of it themselves. And so holding on to that, it is impossible to disentangle their theological conclusions from their very real existence. Um, and you see this in Moltmann's work, especially um, through, you know, the crucified God, et cetera. Um, the crux of his theology is the cross and it is human suffering and it is God's extreme solidarity with humanity. And I don't quite know that he would have reached those conclusions on his own without his own wartime experience. And so I think how we experience the world deeply influences how we understand us to exist in relation to God. Um, now, however, the good Christian in me wants to say that the Trinity is always the starting point, is always, you know, the mirror for um, how human relations should be. However, we would not arrive at these conclusions without our own suffering, our own very real human state, um, and, and what it means to exist in a body um, and experience death and suffering. So um, I, I really do think that how we live and move in society informs how we understand God to be. And that's, you know, I, I don't want to say that's completely outside of scripture or theological teaching or tradition, um, but we can we can understand how we form our ideas based on the suffering of the human state, I think. No, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I like that, um, that idea of, you know, our experience, at least with some of these thinkers, can be sort of, inseparable from their theology. Um, <clears throat> it actually reminds me of Martin Buber, <laughs> who is who is still one of my favorites because um, he, you know, he just enjoyed that. I don't know, he always took such an anthropological point of view of <laughs> humans first, we meet God through each other, through a, a genuine meeting of each other, which is more complex than just dialogue um buber obviously means 
uh, a kind of dialogue where we experience the other in some type of form. Um, but yeah, it, it, it almost reminded me of this. Sometimes I wonder if the debate is even worth it because um, Buber's uh, gripe with Kierkegaard was that Kierkegaard was like, you have to, you know, meet God first, basically have God on this really intimate level. And then you can meet human beings on, on their genuine level. Um, but then Buber kind of reverses it. He's like, no, you have to meet human beings first and then you meet God. And sometimes I'm like, I don't know. I don't think there is a right answer per se, like on like, cause it just seems like it's inseparable. At, at least if you, if you really think about it, it, it really seems inseparable. And so sometimes I feel like that debate is, uh, is like even, even a trap for myself. I remember I spent like just months thinking about it. I was like, no, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't think, I don't think we can argue the order of this. It just, it seems like we have to really consider the inseparability of both. And, and it's funny because Trinity carries that kind of inseparability in some ways that you can't think the father without the you know the spirit and the and, and the son and, it, and it's just it, it's almost like there is something definitely there about about that yeah uh, yeah and I'll, I'll let you i'll let you respond if you have anything yeah no absolutely um i think you're totally right and i think that none of us exist in a vacuum um we are essentially a network of relationships you know with each other and then with god as well um and so you know i love martin buber i love ian now and his understanding of miracles um and i love kierkegaard as well um i think with kierkegaard you know he he hated hegel um and his biggest <laughs> critique you know was that human beings and and god are dissimilar we don't we don't lie on a continuum and there's a mediation of grace that's happening um however you know i love paul tillich as well and mm. i think that his understanding of god as the ontological ground of being um really helps us to understand that every relationship that we have um, is already existing in God, essentially in God's grace, in the being of God, et cetera. And so, you know, I want to be careful here to not, you know, get too close to pantheism, but more so stay within panentheism. And so that God is within the world, but also unique and separate. Um, and I think that understanding God as the ground of being is the best way to understand, uh, from my perspective, you know, that it's not a who came first, either or sort of situation, but it's that God is already existing within our relationships to each other. We already have, you know, sort of this, um, uh, you know, sort of divine access almost to God. Um, however, you know, we're still human beings. We we still require, you know, and this is getting into Karl Barth as well, but we still require God's mediation of, of grace um, to be saved in regards to salvation. Um, but these, this, uh, you know, I don't know, golden thread, this sort of, um, it, it, it is a network that's happening with individuals and it is divine to a degree from my perspective. No, yeah, I agree. I think, I think that is the common element instead of debating the ordering that whether you take it from the Kierkegaard point or the Buber point of view, it's still essentially saying that God mediates in some fashion, right? <laughs> They're either saying <laughs> earlier or later, um, whether, whether we want to die in that hill or not, um, I really like Tillich's, I remember, I, actually, I do remember Tillich saying, you know, God is the sort of like ground of being, um, which makes it better because in that sense, you don't need to debate the ordering. Yep. Because you're exactly. already, you're already there. That is yep. the premise that we're starting with. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Um, so I, I, I love that. Um, it, it also reminds me, I mean, I haven't completely finished. I remember I was, I was like halfway through it, but, uh, Telex very, you know, famous little uh, courage to be, um, 
I really find that now like such an important work um, just because it, we are, you know, labeled as the age of anxiety and Tillich is, I remember giving a, a quite an interesting breakdown on the history of anxiety and the response. <laughs> and I found it really fascinating that he labeled certain eras as like, yeah, this was like the guilty kind of era where, it, you know, anxiety was predicated on like this notion of guilt. Um, but then he kind of predicted that we were going to be in a, uh, a state of anxiety that was more um, spiritual um, wise. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious uh, what, what, you, what you think of, about that other aspect of uh, Tillich's work and, and yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love Courage to Be. Um, and it's, um, I also am, at the same time, there's a sermon that he wrote that's in one of his like collections of sermons called You Are Accepted. And it, it sort of, those two kind of go together in my head as, you know, um, existential theology, right? Um, it's understanding, you know, in, in the sermon, you're accepted, you know, he talks about, it's like right around the time he was writing that right around the time of World War II. And so he highlights, you know, there's people dying in droves every single day, you know, this is the, the height of, you know, what could be considered just emptiness, right? Um, and the same goes for the anxiety as well. I mean, it's looking over this this ledge into into the complete unknown. Um, and that there is something about our human condition that is courageous enough to hope um, to seek the transcendent on the horizon. Um, and the transcendent line would be God, would be the divine. Um, and so I do think that there are as there's a lot of aspects of modernity the time that we exist in that are very nihilistic um it's very easy i think especially with the internet uh you know to be black pilled and just give up hope um and a lot of you know what we receive sort of in mainstream culture is empty um or cheap or not good for us um and so it, it takes a large amount of courage, I think, um, for us existing in the modern age to set our sights beyond anything except what's immediately in front of us. Um, and, you know, I wish I would love to know what Tillich would have to say with, um, you know, the climate crisis, with ecological mm -hmm. grief um with sort of this peak capitalism that we live in um and sort of the emptiness and nihilism that comes with it however you know i think there's something distinctly interesting for theologians writing post-world war ii because they experienced that as well and you know that brought with it the death of god theology and christian atheism and things like this um that attempt to almost move past god um, or at least to try to reckon with, um, I mean, just the utter destruction of World War II and having the world, it's like the world ended, right? How do you exist after the world ends? Um, and I feel like we are in our own mini epoch right now of saying we can, we can almost see the world ending. How do we live in a new world you know um it's i i wish that uh he he could write on it i guess not but, <laughs> but i see similarities you know to writing um in the in the wake of world war ii and and maybe what we are on the precipice of um now yeah no i agree i would really like to hear what he would say um even even if he had thoughts about AI, I, you know, I wonder what he would comment on, um, you know, because lately the conversation does seem to shift in that direction now. AI, AI, chat GPT, kind of what is the future for it? And it always results in this sort of like, we can't really ever tell, I mean, it 
to me it's always like it's too quick to be it's just doom all doom um and it, and it's and it's too quick to say that it's it's gonna be all great <laughs> and, and and dandy and and this is where i feel like sometimes the because we this this area is unquestionable sometimes um i really feel like it tells more about the question it's more of a question of man ironically like this is where i like to frame it it's it's not a question i mean i think ai is definitely involved but i think it really goes back to this question of man um and and what does it mean to be this human being again? Because I think a lot of the panic, ironically, is the fact that we've defined ourselves in some type of capacity that is uh, basically a correspondence of the AI. So we're now we're panicking and going like, oh my gosh, if the AI can do this, then I'm out of my job. Uh, you know, I, I can't do anything. And it seems like the AI uh, promotes some type of loss of identity and, and hopelessness. But I I think this is why I, I always love Kierkegaard, because I feel like we need more irony. <laughs> we need more irony in our lives here. The the state, the state of our hopelessness, if you know, if I were just to sort of you know describe some of the panic going on, the describe the, the state of our hopelessness is the perfect conditions to have hope and have courage like this is to me the perfect condition for these things uh the real question is um and this is where i get really curious with tillich and Kierkegaard, and i would love to hear what they would say now and and even martin buber um is how does today look like to have courage you know what does it look like to have courage today to have hope today um without it sort of leaning on some type of um certain ideology as such you know like we don't really have a certainty about this but there is still hope and yeah i'm just curious what your thoughts are where it was happening uh, in your mind when you're hearing this <laughs> yeah no i mean i think we i think we do live in the age of hyper anxiety right um and like i said you know sometimes it feels like we're teetering on sort of this precipice and when are we going to pass the point of no return either when it comes to you know the environment or technology and crossing into singularity you know to get kind of science fiction -y, which i i love um to consider that but it it doesn't feel too far off right um and i think you know as as christians there's a calling to remain hopeful um so we are free agents in the world um and a lot of well let's just say virtually all of the problems we're dealing with are of our own creation um and we're free agents, we're relying upon God. However, we can act in this world um, to better it, to build the kingdom here. Um, and so I, I like to consider that, that we're, we're facing the unknown, but we're facing it with courage and hope. Um, and maybe that sounds a little corny, but it's, it's, it's pretty radical. It's pretty radical. Um, to to do that from my perspective and i was listening to this podcast today um called the sacred and they were interviewing this guy named dougald hein and they were talking about the ecological crisis and you know i, I mean i wish i could remember i'm going to paraphrase it terribly but it was really really brilliant um about this idea of the world ending and what does it look like to build in the ruins of that world and what does it look like to answer your highest calling um and they were like does it you know look like just accumulating crap and being hot and knowing nothing or does it look like you know answering literally the highest calling to move forward with courage and strength and um i was like whoa um that's that's really 
um, really profound from my perspective um, because, you know, it is, from my perspective as a Christian, you know, it, it, there's a moral obligation um, to be taking care of creation, to be a good steward, you know, to be living in moderation, to be helping those around you, to be caring for others. Um, but that feels distinctly out of step with the world uh, most of the time. Mm. Um, and so it's almost like you need courage to even step into that calling or your obligation. Nobody's going to punish you if you don't answer that obligation. You know, you're making that decision of your own free will. Um, but then it also comes down to what does that even look like for you as a person? We have a lot of teaching, you know, a lot of tradition. However, if we limit ourselves and we believe that Christianity can't change and move with the times, then we're never going to be able to address things like, you know, ecological crisis, uh, you know, AI takeover, things like that, you know, um, we have to we have to learn to alter the course as needed that is the wise aspect of christianity growing as it moves forward in time yeah it's almost like uh it's almost like we need like a kind of situ uh, situational christianity almost right like we and let's say if we we're taking the Trinity seriously, right? Like the world, not only uh, us human beings, but what the world demands is also sort of in relation um, to us as well. Um, and so it, it means not just thinking and, and, and trying to protect our sort of like Christian um, ideas, but it's it's thinking about Christian ideas in relation to each other, Christian ideas in relation to the world, its context, what it demands. It almost seems like ironically, this is what it means to be Christian. <laughs> you know, because I feel like if we go back to like New Testament, Jesus arriving, um, Jesus seems to be responding to not just his relation to people and the current state of like uh, the understanding of God and everything else, but also to the the state of the world and 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 what it's demanding. And he and it was radical what Jesus did, you know. It really was. Um, and so it it is surprising that it's it's almost like the question that needs to be asked in some ways is what does it mean to be radical now in society? And, and this was one of the questions that I asked myself, like, I think like recently, uh, which was something I, I kind of already asked you was like, I was like, what is it, what does it even look like to have courage today? Like, I, I, I feel like there is no good reason to have courage today. Um, and I think that is, for me, the, the ironic part is that courage already demands a sort of non-reason, mm -hmm. uh, sort of groundless state. And this is where I like Tillich here because Tillich roots um, courage in a, in a more ontological position rather than a virtue kind of position. Um, and so that means that, like you said, we already need to have courage just to step in uh the the you know step in this idea and and then begin to you could say have manifest courage um and and, and so many of us are afraid to um i guess we don't realize uh, how many of us are so comforted by the the already kind of set out discourses of christianity where entertaining a new discourse, what does it mean to deal with the ecological crisis? Um, and I think a lot of people are afraid that sometimes dealing with the ecological crisis means re-looking at the Christian ideas again. But for me, that's that's perfect because it means that the you know Trinitarian thinking is is not a static uh, thing. 
it's very much a sort of a lively discourse, right? Where it's like two human beings also change within the discourse of time. Um, so it means getting to know the world and getting to know God simultaneously. And this is what needs to kind of happen on, on a you know daily, uh, the rest of our lives, basically. Um, it means it's a it's a living word. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll let you say what you think on this. Yeah, no, I um ab absolutely. I mean, I fully agree with you. I um I I think that if we believe that reality is teleological in nature, um, if we are moving towards an eschaton, um, that we have to admit that Hegel might have been right. Um, when he said that as time progresses, um, things become more articulated. Um, and so that means that our understanding is progressing through time. And if our understanding is progressing through time, our faith must progress through time as well. And that means it has to address challenges. It has to address new ages. We have to have a way to connect the beginning of Christianity to where we are over 2000 years later. Culture doesn't look like it did back here. We have had to have found a way to move forward in time. And that means meeting these challenges that we are, you know, coming across because, you know, there's this idea of, of radical hope or eschatological hope, which is, you know, hope in the face of basically, you know, near annihilation. And I think that theologians working in the post-World War II sort of environment had that spark of radical hope. Um, and I think that that is something that we will need moving forward. We don't know what the world is going to look like. You know, I don't want to keep, um, you know, bringing up climate change, but I think it's a very real possibility for what we're going to have to consider with world systems changing, with what life is going to look like, um, you know, with climate refugees. I mean, there's all these things that could be on the horizon for us. Um, what will that look like? You know, how do we have hope in that sort of environment? Um, and so, you know, now as theologians, you could consider it as what is the best plan? If we know that this is in store for us, what is this going to look like and how do we relate to each other? And so sort of thinking about that radical hope and courage, there's um, there's a theologian whose name was Sally McFaig, and she wrote a book called Body of God, and it was in ecological theology. Um, and she wrote this, oh my goodness, um, 80s, 90s, so not recently, she's passed away. Um, but she's essentially exploring a theological model of what if the earth is God's body? Um, and what does that look like for how we are to be stewards? Um, and so I bring that up only to say, you know, embodiment and incarnational theology is really important for you know, again, relationships, how do we consider this? If, if the incarnation truly did happen, what are the reverberations for humanity? How do we relate to each other? How do we act as stewards to the earth? And, you know, in facing something that could be, you know, an earthwide event, you know, how, how do we handle that? How do we relate to the world, to each other and to God? And if God, if God's body is the earth, then does that completely, you know, create a paradigm shift for our relationality? Um, there, there's, these are big questions. And for her, you know, of course it does. It, it changes how we steward the earth and it changes our relationship to the Trinity. Um, and so I, I really think that the book, you know, I just, I just read it you know, maybe a year ago, and it feels just as timely as ever. I mean, it could have been written yesterday, you know. Um, so that's where I am in regards to to courage and relating to others. <laughs> no, I really like that. I really like that. Um, it, it almost reminds me of uh, Nietzsche's exposition on the self. We said before... Uh, he said, basically, the self is the body, which is so fascinating. 
I, I when, when I think about it. He says the self is the body. And so in conjunction with what uh, this other thinker is saying, she uh, that God can possibly be the body the, of the earth, um, it, it does it does spark a kind of new imagination about how to have relations again <laughs> with the world and its context. Um, it, it almost seems um, that's sort of like the needed context in a way. Um, and it, it's so funny because for some reason I was, I was immediately thinking about the, the, the earth, um, what is it? The earth people that think they're the earth is a flat, uh, flat earthers. Flat yeah. earthers. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> I was for some reason I started thinking about that. I was like, huh, huh. Um, it 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 started making me think like you know what? If we started thinking the earth as the body, maybe we would start coming up with different uh, alternatives to flat earth rounders. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but <laughs> uh, so uh, my my next question is: So you brought up Hegel. Um, how is Hegel in? Um, how is Hegel received right now in in your kind of in your experience? Like, I know I I know that I think you know we could probably all say that. Like, I don't have a problem with Hegel. You you seem like you don't have a problem with Hegel per se, but I'm just curious about the kind of reception within. Um, the theological sphere, like how is Hegel received? Yeah. Um, oh goodness. Well, you know, post Hegel, there was sort of the right wing school and the left wing school of Hegelian thought, and so it it really depends where you you fall. I think that um, Hegel's experiencing a bit of a renaissance, um, and especially in in sort of my my realm of of thinking with re relational theology i mean hegel's system is is important for for understanding uh relationality however you know there are plenty of people that have found new reasons to hate hegel to call him um an alchemist a magician a satanist you know so it really depends where you fall and how you interpret um hegel's writings and you know i'm not saying that he's not without controversy but i think some of the controversy around hegel um is the result of people not reading enough hegel to understand um what part they're finding controversial <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the most controversial right there you're like no, i'm not, look i'm not saying it's easy to get through it's not easy to get through but what you know if you you really you really really marinate over it um there's a really good book for anybody that's interested um it's by this guy named diogenes allen and i think it's called it's just like a primer it's called philosophy for understanding theology um, and he runs through a bunch of philosophical systems and how they relate to theology. Uh, and his chapter on Hegel is very, very, very good. It's a, it's a great introduction um, for, um, for understanding the important parts of Hegel in regards to theology. And then there's somebody named um, Peter Hodgson who has written at length about Hegel's influence on theology. And then there is also somebody named Hans Kuhn, who is phenomenal. Um, and his whole theological argument is for Hegelian Christology. So um, mm. there is, there's a lot out there, but again, you know, it's, it's a bit contentious. It depends on who you ask. However, you know, is Zizek being so popular um, and his own sort of theological, you know, writings? Um, I, I think, yeah, I think Hegel's enjoying his own Renaissance right now. So <laughs> I think you are pretty correct. I, I have to say, even, even in like sort of non-academic circles, um just in the online sphere hegel is the topic of conversation hot stuff right now <laughs> yeah it is hot stuff and and not only hegel but lacan is is, is a hot topic at least in in these sort of uh, informal intellectual circles um psychoanalysis Zizek is really the 
the promoter of, of, of these and and yes even um i know right now i've been getting into badu um i'm so mm -hmm. curious as to what i'll be able to do with him um i think there's a lot of interesting things that badu says that um it's funny i i recently watched one of his talks on youtube it's called like the em eminence of truths and he he said something fascinating to me he said uh he's, he said that yeah most of his work ironically will align like super theological mm -hmm. um and in, in, in ways um but then he wants to do this slight deviation where it's like not theological and and there's no concept of transcendence um in this case um but he's he's made me just rethink um so many ideas um and and how math how we think about set theory and in, in relation to i i don't expect you to know set theory i just learned no, about it was like way far beyond me uh, the, uh, yeah no the math stuff <laughs> um, and uh, i'll be i'll be curious what i'll be able to do with him because i'll be like I've, I've already been thinking like i'm like oh you know what i think his set theory and trinity would be a really interesting tie up um he one of the one of the main distinguishments that i really like from badu is this idea of belonging and inclusion uh -huh. um and one of the things that he makes this distinction is that uh he makes it uh for example he gives this example in the book where you're voters and you're like you're part of a family um he says technically uh the the state like you're represented by the state by being a voter right but if one of your family members is not registered in the state um i forgot how he framed it but it's either that yeah it's you guys are included but you guys are not represented because um there's there's somebody that's not a voter in the in the family it's not registered by the state so um essentially he's making this distinguishment between inclusion and belonging so technically like there's a lack of belonging but you're included um and i i've always enjoyed thinking about this because it, it it can i think in trinitarian wise the trinity seems to work uh in ways that they all belong as one and they're also all included and and Badu's main gripe is that we need to be included and belong to have presentation and representation and this for him is the adequate state of the situation uh at least this is i'm speaking so early on this because i barely know him <laughs> but, but um, there's some theological opportunity there <laughs> yeah, yeah. i do i feel like there is some there's some opportunities there for sure um i i do have one more uh well i have several questions but it seems like i did not plug in my laptop so it's about to die so i'm gonna grab that <laughs> okay <laughs> Um, but while I'm at it, um, so you you said also you've been going getting back into uh, feminist theory. Um, is there? I'm curious. Actually, is there any type of like Hegelian kind of feminism going on? Uh, no. First one. Yeah. <laughs> no. There. There absolutely is. There's. There's definitely the opportunity for that. Um, you know, like, um, and I'm not reading her right now, but there's Lusa Rigore, um, who's sort of um, school of Derrida, who, oh. you know, you, you could follow that through, you know, a Hegel understanding, though it's, you know, it's deconstruction. Um, but, you know, I think at this point, I have more than anything just been reading for fun um been reading you know a lot of naughty reactionary feminists and enjoying it um but there's also plenty of feminist theologians that are amazing um and so yeah i mean i think that you know 
feminist theory is it's in, it's at an interesting juncture um you know i i think that there is some um some splintering happening and it will be interesting over the next you know 10 to 15 years to sort of see what comes of it um if mm -hmm. if there are going to be you know more schools of feminist thought um yeah i um I, I I will be curious to see what what um what happens. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm curious about it too. Um, because like I don't, I mean that that's something that's not even, if I'm being honest, that's something that's not not even really brought up in uh, like the circles that I'm in. You know, um, it's not it's 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 not something that is well. If I'm being honest, theology is typically also not super brought up in the circles that i'm in so <laughs> we're already deprived of that sort of context uh because these are all like philosophy kind of groups but it does i think it definitely does change the conversation um and is there is there feminist thinkers that i mean I, i'm pretty sure there are but if they disagree with each other that you're just kind of like i don't understand why you guys disagree like it's kind of the same you know I, I'm yeah just yeah no I, absolutely i mean you know there's waves of feminism and so we're still in the third wave of feminism however you know it probably some might argue we're moving into a fourth wave at this point um you know there's queer theory there's gender gender critical theory um there's womanist uh theory um i mean it, I I don't quite know that at this point today that there is really a consensus or baseline agreement um, like there might have been in in the late seventies. So um, it's it's a really interesting time. Uh, however, you know, in feminist theology, I think there's there's more coherence. Um, and because there's a focus, you know, the focus is on Christianity to some extent or another. And so you have, you know, lots of really interesting thinkers. Um, process theology is, it's not a new school, but it's sort of, um, you know, I mean, it's popular right now. And I think that it speaks to tradition christian tradition and also god um having the ability to change um through time and i think that that is some may consider it heretical i certainly don't uh, <laughs> it's important and it's prescient uh for our time right now so the theologian i wanted to highlight is katherine keller um mm -hmm. she's one of the main process theologians um her stuff is amazing and um I, she even has a book on process theology and, and the climate crisis. So I haven't read it in like a while. I think it came out last year. I read it right when it came out, but, um, but yeah, no, there's, um, there's lots of interesting stuff happening. Um, right now, uh, you know, on the feminist theory side, I can't say it's all good. Um, it's splintering rapidly, uh, but feminist theology, I'll say, yeah, it's great. Love it. <laughs> but that, I mean, the, the the process theology has always been interesting to me and the fact that uh this sort of a feminist take on it is even more fascinating uh what what do you mean by a, a splintering exactly like what what is, is is there like such a disagreement that it's sort of just fighting against their own kind of movement or or perspectives or, or what do you mean by splintering in this case yeah well every new wave is a critique of the wave that came before it um mm, and yep. so i think right now when it comes to feminist thought you know there is um what i what some call you know reactionary feminism or gender critical feminism um and then a more um sex positive feminism and um they are very distinct camps um and i don't know that 
there will be any sort of resolution between them. And so I'm wondering, you know, what the field of feminist theory is going to look like. And of course, I'm really just highlighting on, on, on two, you know, sort of two main things here. But I think that, um, you know, right now they're the most talked about. It's the most debated. Um, it has the most like real world implications right now that, you know, um, are not too lofty and up here, but actually in praxis happening. Um, and um, th this, th it's, it's very dug in. And um, so, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what, what comes of it. I mean, it, it is, um, it is hostile territory. And I think that's what's made it so interesting to me um, is, is really watching how these schools of thought have traced, you know, their theory, where they've gotten to, um, what it looks like out in the real world, um, the animosity. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's definitely interesting. <clears throat> the animosity. <laughs> it's something that, uh, it's something that I ironically uh, always kind of see a little bit is like, uh, even with like higher, higher level thinkers, I would say we, they, they, they may not necessarily restrict themselves to like a, a theological group or a denominations per se, but it's always funny to me that there can always be like a kind of, fundamentalism that feeds the animosity um in some ways even though they may not necessarily attach themselves to like a specific denomination and sometimes ironically this is this is kind of what concerns me a little bit um mainly because what i've noticed is that now in you could say i guess uh, post-christian if you permit me that term, <laughs> um, it, it seems like now it, it's it's this idea that, okay, we understand that liberal and conservative Christianity is kind of like, mm, um, and we're trying to find answers. Um, but then even those answers start developing their own type of fundamentalism in a way. And it's so crazy to me because I'm like, I thought – we were breaking past the, the the two dichotomies that sort of fed the fundamentalism in the first place, and and then now we're 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 almost. I mean, to me, I feel like we're always haunted in some ways by Derrida's idea of the the logic of the same, the logic of the same, and how eventually everything goes back to being this homogenous thing, and we have to constantly fight the homogenous tendencies and, and 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 going into a kind of fundamentalism again and then i always see it as like a constant uh threat but then you know this is the ironic part and this is where i would bring in Kierkegaard. It's like you can be fundamentalist about not being fundamentalist you know <laughs> and like that that could be that's probably in my opinion sometimes even the the danger also um, because we come into this um, weird position where we want people to be open about concepts. Let's talk Christianity. Let's talk Trinity. But then we're not open about people that are not open. Like that. That's to me the the most, uh, I guess, bewildering part for me. And it's and it's hard to point out that kind of flaw. Uh, in our thinking sometimes. Um, and I feel like you probably see that a lot <laughs> where it's like, uh, you know, we, we're, we're open to everybody that's open, um, but we are close to the closure. Um, but, for, but for me, I think it, it's that tension between somebody that is closed that really feeds the most interesting dialogue, I think. And so when you said it was hostile, I'm like, well, I know it's hostile, but hostile also means it's alive. 
it's yes well absolutely. absolutely yeah i think you know i think as human beings you know we have the tendency to desire identification with a group um we desire things to be black and white to make easy decisions or moral judgments i think this stuff is comforting to us um and so, you know, when you do theology or philosophy, you know, there's a tendency to identify with the school of thought and just that's where you dig in and that's your presupposition, your starting point, whatever. Um, and I do believe at our core, all of us have fundamental values, beliefs, preferences, whatever, that shape how we perceive the world how we you know analyze the world etc um so again you know working from a, a sort of home school of thought um is comforting and also sort of lends to your own legitimacy so um but that being said you know when when it comes to just like even in the broader like pastoral sort of understanding you know, I agree with you. Um, it's it's so easy to immediately say, yep, you're good. Yep, you're good. Yep, you're good to people that are open, that you assume um, have the same sort of beliefs that you do. And then with the people that are closed off or you know them to have, you know, a different belief than you, it, it is, it can be there is tension. I mean, it's difficult. And so that's almost like the final frontier is how do you dialogue constructively with individuals that um, you're in tension with that, um, that oppose you in one way or another. Um, and that tension can create healthy dialogue. You know, I, I think from a personal experience, so I don't identify as an evangelical However, I work with a lot of evangelicals and I have been over the past four or so years. I mean, it has been a, it has been an effort to work to understand where people are coming from, to be able to work with people when I know they have beliefs that oppose mine um, or beliefs that may directly work against my own beliefs and values. Um, how I understand that we have a common humanity how I don't immediately write somebody off as an idiot or a jerk or whatever. Um, it is, it is at times challenging um, to be able to come into situations where you might experience tension and have an open mind about them and expect some level of um, constructive dialogue, relationship building, whatever. But I have found when I can allow myself to be more open in those situations that and I have really fruitful relationships that develop from it. Not always, of course, of course, yeah. but um, more often than not, I'm really pleasantly surprised. You know, I think when we spend so much time up here with theology and philosophy that we can forget, you know, what it looks like to sort of you know, you're not assuming that somebody may have read the same books as you, but that they under, they can understand the concepts. You can have this conversation. You don't have to censor yourself or, or you know, really simplify things. Um, and that learning can happen both ways. So I hope I'm sort of getting at your idea here. But, you know, just from personal experience, you know, I have found to sort of just be unassuming and open to others, especially when I know that they may oppose me, um, has has really yielded uh, something positive. So that's where I am. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that it, this is the ironic, like, Christian sentiment, too, right? Like, this sort of come as you are. But we we don't like like we we talk about it all the time but man like the come as you are is probably the most difficult thing to actually maintain um and it's and it's not and like and like you said it's it's not always i mean it does require an openness but it's a sort of radical openness yes right? it's not it's not just openness it's not that we're just open to new ideas it's that we're open to the contradiction 
of people that are even against those ideas. And, and that is also a kind of courage, a kind of um, hope, weirdly enough, um, that a lot of us don't uh, sometimes pay attention to. But I think, you know, I think we can, whether other people can do it or not, I think some of us can do it and it can be really life changing on, on, a, on, a, on a micro scale too, just within the relations that we have. Um, and I know you say that you're a grant writer, so I'm curious, uh, is there times where you're writing well, I don't know. I don't know if you can answer this. Actually, I don't know if you want to, but you can. You can tell me if this could be like a, just like a no comment. We'll edit this one out. Uh, <laughs> um, is there ever a time where you're writing like these grants um, where you're like, uh, like I don't know how I feel about this organization? Um, you know, is is there moments where you're like, kind of maybe I don't know if it, it would be ethically or concern in some type of way um has there ever been moments like that for you yeah no i mean one one example always jumps to mind um so obviously you know in my job i operate at the highest level of ethics that i can um and there was an experience at an organization i worked for where um i was writing a proposal to a notoriously conservative um, foundation. And we were preparing to send the proposal and we got a call from them and they said, hey, we're just going around to our funders and we're, we're just asking them a couple questions because the questions will decide whether or not we will fund them anymore. And the question was, essentially, do you support or affirm the existence of LGBTQ people. And it has stuck in my mind ever since because, you know, I was employed for the organization and the organization was very conservative and I still had to write that proposal. It had no mention. It had nothing to do with affirming anyone. It was a proposal for program support in Michigan. <laughs> um, but I've always known that conversation happened. And I've always known that and it was for a very large gift. It was for about $150,000. Um, mm. And they told us, they disclosed to us that they had stopped funding a certain university in their area because, you know, they had the audacity to affirm human beings. Um, and, you know, it's always stuck with me because, you know, it was a point where my employment and my own personal ethics came into direct tension mm. and, you know, there was nothing I could do or say. But I think about this situation all the time and thankfully I've not encountered it since um, that it's incredible to me that individuals can hold these beliefs and still call themselves good Christians. Um, I think that's probably what's most upsetting about it is that people can choose to withhold huge sums of money from nonprofits who do direct services for people in prison, for homeless shelters, you know, for whatever, um, based on something as inconsequential as that to me um i uh i still think about that it was probably like three years ago at this point um but i, I think it really highlights what we were talking about earlier you know you you are interacting with individuals who directly oppose you or your beliefs your values whatever directly oppose large portions of society um and also at the same time are leveraging extreme amounts of power through monetary donations, through, you know, social sway, all of these things that sort of circle back yet again 
to the idea of this hierarchical trinity where you know because you have monetary power you are dominating um, and dictating how you would like the world to look for you um it's gross <laughs> it, it, it always this is something that like, I, I never I, I never understood as a child um you know like I, I so for example I grew up seventh day at Venice actually my my family my mother's side is like I wouldn't say like hardcore Seventh Day Adventist, but it's basically like all they know. That's yeah. all they know. Um, and I didn't know till when I was getting older that, you know, this doesn't have to be the status quo of things. Um, this doesn't have to be like this. Um, I remember prodding around a little bit more and like I, I started realizing that like, you know, my mom and you know, it's not, I don't find it anybody's fault per se. Um, it's just they never, they just never dived into other areas of thought. That was just, you know, it was, it was just, that was it. It was just, this is the way things are. Um, and I went this route where I was like, okay, well, I'm not sure if I want to be Christian. I'm, I'm not sure if I want to do this stuff anymore. Um, I, I never, I never was like, you know, I didn't, I had such little knowledge, <laughs> it's so little, uh, that I started diving into other, um, religions and I was Muslim for a little while too. Um, and it, but it was, but all those experiences were super enlightening for me. Um, and this is where like, I even had to come to grips with my own, where it was like, exactly what you're talking about where um i you know i've i've been i feel like i've been on both sides of the spectrum before it's like i've been on that sort of more radical like co conservative ish like i never got like super but i was definitely at one point like on a conservative uh uh poll and then you know the other side as well but like you said, right, it's like, it, it gets ridiculous in the sense to have the, it's funny that you said like, it's the audacity to affirm human beings. Like, I really love that <laughs> that uh, that statement of like the audacity to affirm human beings. I have the audacity. <laughs> but it really does seem so radical to do that now in in theology almost too, where it's like, it it's almost like we can't even separate the um, the political ideals that infiltrated too because it's like and i feel like that's probably the biggest problem as well where and i've heard you know people variety of people say this to me where it's like no you know they they say something like it doesn't necessarily when you become a christian it doesn't necessarily mean that you are conservative or whatever but a lot of people that make the argument kind of go, even though conservative doesn't match up completely with Christianity, it matches up enough to say that basically if you are Christian, you're supposed to be conservative and so on. But I always feel like that conservative ideal sort of become as a sort of replacement for the theology in some ways, because it's like, oh, we can't deviate this theology because it deviates the political ideals it starts deviating everything um and then it's like um when i start thinking about it more it, it's almost like you're stripping away and, and this is something that i've always had conflict with myself where it's like i i come into this tension where i don't i don't want to make the person feel like i've stripped their entire homeland from them Yes. Like they're basically yes. like their hopes and dreams, their whole ground of being. If we're if we're gonna stay, you know, with Tillich terms, I don't want to be this person where I'm like I'm stripping away their entire ground of being. Where because once you do that, it's like they they just go into this mode of just like uh, in my experience, uh, you know, the, you've totally put them in an existential crisis. Basically, <laughs> like you fed it to them. Um, 
and and I've always find it difficult to find this balance of I don't want to I don't want them to be so stripped of their ground that they they have a reaction of just like pure annihilation basically um you know where they they see the world that they knew that they thought was um just burst into pieces and i think a lot of the times uh we're fighting that from happening that bursting that kind of annihilation of our world of our view and i've had it happen to me so many times <laughs> but i and, and 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 this is the part that i also struggle with too it's like the the fact that not everybody can can do the bursting not everybody can go through the annihilation and i've always struggled with like how how do we deal with people that can and people that can never possibly i mean i, I always want to say there's hope and, and that these people can have their world kind of reconfigured in a way and uh without necessarily completely pulling the rug under them because i think I think that is ultimately the threat that they all try to fight is that if you fight this trinitarian ideas you're pulling the rug from under their being right they their dedication their work their their efforts i mean the, to me this is when i start humanizing in, in some form um and and that's the part um but then but then there's this other tension where it's like but you can't give up yours <laughs> Right, you can't give up yours. You can't do this weird move where you give them everything because you're trying to maintain some type of humanity and and protect them from the ground of being slipping. But you can't let your ground of being completely slip either for the other. So it, it is this really weird um, position that I always feel kind of gets. It's never explicitly said with with these debates and theology um and, and philosophy but i can always hear them you know you can always hear that there is what i call an impasse in thought yeah like you can you will talk to somebody they're so smart they're so brilliant um and then all of a sudden there's a specific topic or a specific thought that's like no like don't don't ever go there because i will tell you no and there's no room to even think of the, about that position that is just a no um yeah i'm i'm, I'm just i yeah i'm curious uh, i know you have thoughts <laughs> yeah no you know i i think that every sort of theological conversation that hits an impasse um usually results in it almost feels like um like knee-jerk anger right that's like the default response usually um but i find that that initial experience of anger can a, a seed is planted right and you know whether or not you're going to spend time sort of going through these stages where anger ends up being curiosity or whether anger just stays anger is really up to the other person. So, you know, that seed that's planted from that impasse, you know, might lead to somebody, their own, you know, journey, their own faith journey, however that ends up looking. I, I am not a fan of deconstruction, but I will say this, that I think that for folks that have come from a fundamentalist background, they might be returning to their faith. They might be exploring doing some deconstruction may be worthy for them. Um, but it doesn't end with deconstruction because if you strip away, strip away, strip away, you're left with no objective truth. You're left with no sort of central focal point of the faith and you have nothing. You have spiritual, but not religious, essentially. You have to do the work after deconstruction to reconstruct your faith. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people are put in this position where they have to tend to and address their own religious trauma. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that can lead to the impasse that can lead to completely turning away from religion. You know, it, it can do a lot of harm. And I, I think we're doing a disservice if we just say deconstruction's bad. End of story. Well, 
what all these people do with this trauma that they've experienced from something that they were essentially, you know, victimized by. Um, it's, it, those are, it's a really big question. Um, and I think that doing the deconstructing work and reconstructing work um, looks very differently for lots of people. It might include, you know, looking at other faiths, trying out different things. Um, it's, I mean, really at the end of the day, faith is a lifelong journey. Um, and, you know, that sounds cliche, but really think about it. You know, you started out here at one point as a child and now you're in your 30s and you're somewhere completely different. And, you know, maybe when you're 60, you'll be somewhere completely different from here. So I, I think that that's important. And, um, you know, as far as seeding ground and being nice, um, Stanley Harawas wrote a really good article. Well, it was more like a conversation, but it was published like an article about the difficulties of pastoral care and um, sort of this um, audacious mission we take on as Christians and that, you know, anybody can do pastoral care and it's not always being nice and being somebody's counselor. Um, sometimes it includes hard truths, hard realities. It's not always being soft and sweet, um, but it is being, you know, a good friend um, and telling somebody something, whether they want to hear it or not, because it's for their betterment. Um, mm. And so I'll, I'll send you the article. It's really good. It's like one of my favorite ever. It's so, it's so wonderful. Um, but I think we are put in this point of just eternal tension um, where, you know, we are occasionally stuck being the person that is not perceived as being too nice while we exist in a culture where we're always supposed to be, you know, seeding ground, we're always supposed to be, you know, nice and um, paying platitudes to others. And it's, it's really not always beneficial um, for spiritual growth, for growth as a human being. And then the last thing I'm going to touch on is for this is, liberation theology and as far as you know politicized faith you know i i think liberation theology catholic workers you know um christian socialists wh whatever is is a good intersection for how your personal politics and your faith can actually coincide um in a, in a positive way because with liberation theology you you can you can see in in the time in history when it was formed that theologians were realizing that people were living in abject poverty and misery and that the politics and things happening in the world directly affected that situation and created that situation and so theology takes on a liberatory stance and we understand that in order to enact liberation, there has to be a level of political involvement um, because we live in a society, right? Um, it goes back to that inclusion and belonging thing. If we exist in a society and we have certain moral beliefs and values and we see that other individuals are living in misery, you know, um, we can take this beyond the mass incarceration. We can take it, you know, just how far we want in the culture that we live in and understand that we exist here and we are free agents and we must act. And whether we like it or not, we do exist in a political system. So politics are influencing our lives, our faith, how we are acting in the world. And so I think it's a good counterpoint to what we are experiencing now is the status quo with basically Christian nationalism, um, which is, you know, the far right married to, you know, ultra conservative evangelical beliefs. Um, they're, they're intertwined. They're going together. There's a huge amount of political power and money there. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty dangerous um, mm. from, from my perspective. So, that's what I got for that. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is this is also what makes like conversation hard with like other people that are um, maybe even like interested in Christianity to some points, right? 
they would entertain it but then basically all they have uh, as an understanding of christianity is the sort of christian nationalism that is sort of made there and um it seems to also be a lot of the arguments uh for not being religious not being you know and, th and this creates a whole other worm of like of questions and 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 other topics and and debates and um but i do think there's something that you brought up there religious trauma i feel like this is actually isn't talked about enough and it's almost like um we say it we almost think it like doesn't exist uh, in some ways like this idea of like religious trauma um of one of the one of the the kind of i don't know discoveries that i had for myself is that if you can leave a religion and not have any resentment uh frustration with it you left it well like you 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 left it in a way that was still loving you yeah. can you know i think i think people forget this idea that you can leave something behind in a loving way it doesn't have to be this violent utter annihilation antagonism with your own life it can be something that you can look back on and be like yeah you know i you know maybe i acted like this uh and i believe these ideas i don't believe them now um and then the, and the, but then there's no reason to necessarily hate i because I, I think what i discover sometimes is that because you said deconstruction your point on deconstruction was very uh important here because i've also argued some of the same things where i'm like deconstruction uh is more like a tool like it just helps you just you know uh deconstruct like what you kind of went through and, and and your world but deconstruction never helps you like start thinking reconstruction right <laughs> like everyone's like no let's just stay here and i'm like no <laughs> like we we need to construct something again you you have to in some sense stand for something again you have to do this move where like but i think what ends up happening is you have this regressive development in the in the personality actually carl Jung talks about this where uh it was a very cool example He's, he talks about a guy that was um playing the stock stock market and he basically lost a lot he he, he lost horribly and carl Jung talks about how that made a sort of ego deflation in him because now he doesn't want to take a risk again and and my my danger with deconstruction is that people will use deconstruction as a way to not take a risk again yeah and and, and this is where we we can find ourselves because even though you you've done the work to not be a conservative christian or, or maybe a super liberal and, and now you want to find something in the middle something something different something a, a sort of different answer um deconstruction can get you there but it's not going to get you there in the sense of actually finding that answer you're just going to sort of remain in this i don't know i mean i almost want to say like it's just this position of nowhere um that it, it needs to also be somewhere it, it, ironically um and i think I think it is because they're afraid of falling into some type of dogmatism again, some type of sentiment uh, of that way. But I, I don't see, uh, in my opinion, I don't see any, I don't think we can escape this. I don't think we, like, I, I think it's inevitable that you you go through the deconstruction, you, you, you again encounter another temptation of, of of making this position your your solid forever home <laughs> you know and and, yes. and i feel like the you know the saints the saints understood this very well that it was never just one thing 
and done. It was you overcame one temptation and then now you're encountering another and another and another. And it just never stops. Um, and I think sometimes we, we get void avoidance in the, in this scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think you're totally right. You know, I think that, you know, maybe the moments before deconstruction are sort of maybe someone's dark night of the soul, you know, and, um, and they're maybe going through a traumatic experience, an extreme low point in leaving you know, maybe their church home, maybe an abusive situation. And, you know, there's all these things that we take for granted if we haven't experienced them. Um, and, and maybe we don't understand why it takes some people longer on this journey than others. I mean, there's all sorts of factors here. Um, but you're absolutely right. You, If you stop at deconstruction, you go, well, I'm fully deconstructed. You're still in a liminal space you have not arrived at any sort of final conclusion. You know, honestly, I don't think that even as Christians, any of us will arrive at a final conclusion until we're dead. You know, like you don't, there's no stopping point on this journey. You're moving through life. You have to keep moving. I think there is a fear of, a fear of dogma, a fear of sort of rebuilding what you imagine maybe in your core to be traumatic. You don't want to experience that again. There's an aversion to it. There's an aversion to any sort of um, um, doctrine that may direct your life. It's very understandable, you know, but I, I think really at the core of this, you know, is understanding that there's a difference here. You know, faith is, is a thing that we experience and we understand that faith is centered on God. However, church life is the action of human hands. Human hands do not equal the existence of faith nor the existence of God. We have to understand that if we've experienced harm in a religious setting, that it's not harm from God or Christianity or whatever, it's harm from another individual. Um, it's harm from a system that is not in line with, you know, the religious experience. So all of this is very difficult to disentangle, especially, you know, if you're in a fundamentalist setting or a cult setting, something like that, where this is this experience of harm can be all consuming. Right. And you leave, you have the courage to leave and you never want to experience it again. Mm -hmm. How do you find the courage and vulnerability to potentially re-enter this thing that you perceived as harmful that was harmful you know i mean there's there's so many questions here and it is it is completely different for every every individual um that i wish it was linear but <laughs> no faith journey seems to be <laughs> linear and it is full of you know it is full of regressions it's full of temptations it's full of um you know situations to completely divert us off of it um that it, it, it is not, but also I think it's important to find comfort in, in knowing that this isn't easy, that it's going to be difficult forever. Um, there, there has to be some level of hope and courage um, because despair is a pitfall as well. You know, if you, you deconstruct or you despair and you say, this will never work for me, I'm never attempting to do this again. That is a spiritual death. Mm -hmm. Um which, you know, is sad. It's it's sad to be like, oh, if somebody falls into despair, that's, you know, could be spiritual death. But um, we have to remain hopeful. And it is so hard. It is so hard to do that sometimes. So, um, you know, I really do feel for individuals that are um, that are going through, you know, their deconstruction experience. You know, it's funny because like one of the people in my cohort at school was like, I was talking with her about this and she was like, I'm in my reconstruction era. And I just started like laughing so hard. <laughs> but then like, you know, I was talking to her and it's like, she comes from a fundamentalist background. She somehow found the courage to deconstruct. She went to seminary. She, you know, reconstructed her Christian faith through seminary and like has emerged on the other side of it, you know, obviously this is still her journey and still her experience, but like it takes an incredible amount of courage 
to go through that just of your own volition because nobody will make you do this except yourself no yeah you're right it, it's it, it's one of those things that it still fascinates me to this day um a concept i mean we call this like timing or god's intervention in this stuff um but it's always surprised me that like you encounter people that you've probably told them like a million times like hey you know this is how this is my advice to you as a friend how you should go about it um and then all of a sudden like years later they're like hey uh, you know they're doing the exact thing that you told them to do but it took um it took them a kind of experience a kind of realization and for them to finally enact that advice and and see that kind of thing that you're pointing out and and this is something that has always kind of like stunned me because like uh i kept thinking like okay so how do we how do we force this <laughs> how do we force this timing element in life um and anyways in my own thinking i you know i came to the conclusion that obviously you can't um it has to do more with a kind of framing um it's the framing in my opinion that allows you to encounter more aha moments in life um which has been very important for me um but this concept of hope i think it's, it's so it's super important now in my opinion because I, I think i think the danger with hope and i'll be curious what, what you think about this um, i think the danger with hope is that we can't help but couple hope with a kind of idea of what that hope should look like and i think epistemologically that's kind of problematic mainly because it becomes something that uh, is so dependent on that idea that is coupled with hope. And sometimes that idea assumes some type of knowing about the circumstance, the context of what the situation demands. Um, and I think we lean so much on that idea that when we encounter the the manifestation of the opposite we become hopeless again and or 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 we respond in a kind of way that is you know angry and upset and frustrated and you know we thought that this was the way we thought this was the christian the right kind of christian theology like you said rachel there's no conclusion <laughs> in the end there's really no real conclusion that we have it is a, it is a kind of journey um and so I, I've been playing with this idea of hope where hope has to remain in the condition that it was predicated on, meaning that we started off hopeless. Hope has to maintain that condition of hopelessness. Ironically enough, I, I feel like this is the ironic position of, of myself where like the very thing that allowed you to have hope was hopelessness. And so we need to have a kind of hope in our hopelessness, but not in a kind of melancholia kind of way, not where we become stunted and not do something, but it's more like a, a kind of loving hopelessness where it's kind of like that. I, I've always enjoyed this sentiment where it's like, I am hopelessly in love with you. I am hopelessly um, so in love with the state of whatever that I cannot help but do something. I cannot help but engage, like you say, like the human hands, um, so to speak. I'm sort of grasping in the dark, hopelessly and helplessly, but I am doing so anyways, because I am helplessly and hopelessly in love with God and so on. And I feel like that, at least in my opinion, is probably the framing that we kind of need because when hope becomes, I guess you could say, hopeful, <laughs> it gets so full of the ideas that um, it can, again, and this has to do with religious trauma, it can, again, stunt us and, and we refuse to have the courage to be again um, because of what had happened before. And I, 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 I like the position of to have a hopeless hope <laughs> um, and, and, and keep it 
keep it empty, keep it filled with a brim of promise that you don't know what that promise is, but we are trying to just, you know, but we do so anyways. It, it's kind of like when, when people are stunted by me and they go like, well, you don't believe in, in such certainties or whatever. So how do you kind of like enact in the world? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I enacted the world by, again, doing an ironic move where it's like, I don't know, but I'm doing so anyways. I am choosing to do so. And, and I've always enjoyed embracing this kind of way of living. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think you're spot on, like for, you know, an I ideal state as a Christian, right? Um, so we are as human beings, completely helpless, right? And we require God's grace. Um, and when we begin to maybe treat God like a genie and say, well, you know what? I really need this house, so you better give it to me. <laughs> or I'm really hoping for this or that or the other. Um then, you know, the outcome is going to be disappointment. So again, you know, when you fix all your ideas on hope, um, it is going to end in sort of this dejected state, um, which can lead to despair. And so it's, um, I want to, yeah, I want to carry that thought into sort of this this notion of almost like a holy foolishness mm -hmm. right we're we're completely dependent um we're a victim of circumstance we require god's intervention um yet we are existing as these completely helpless entities um and this just state of almost naivete right mm -hmm. um when you sort of surrender yourself to whatever will happen in your life and ask for God's, you know, just will to be done in your life, then you sort of enter open handed. And I'm not going to say empty, you know, yeah. but you put yourself in a better position, a more ideal position as a Christian to live in this world. Um, because if you continue to set ideas for yourself and just are disappointed over and over again, you know, it, it, nothing good will come of it. You know, you can certainly ask for discernment from God and you, you know, should, you know, enter into prayer and should express your concerns. Um, but I keep coming back to the idea of this sort of just like foolishness, almost ignorance, um, just surrendering uh to god's will more or less um which is 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 better than uh attempting to demand stuff of god <laughs> <laughs> no i i agree with you it's uh i like that term actually like kind of holy um foolishness um it's it's funny because like you know even when we go back to like jacob um yeah, I believe it's Jacob, right? Um, where he's getting punished. And he's like, I don't know why I'm getting punished like this. And all of his friends are like just giving him reasons. Like, well, obviously you did something. Like you definitely did something wrong. Like God wouldn't do it without reason. Um, and, and yet ironically, it does kind of... <laughs> I've always like this is the part that always stunned me. It's the fact that it begins with some type of bet. <laughs> the you know Satan goes, "Hey, I bet you know that I can basically swing Jacob in a kind of way against you." And, and God's like, "Okay, go ahead. Like, <laughs> let's play this out." Um, and it's funny that the way Satan kind of manifests in this book is is through some kind of reason. Um, that you did something wrong you clearly went against god and and that we know what god wants and what god reasons and and and, and all this ways and then at the end of the day uh, by the time you get to the end of the book um it's god saying only i speak for myself right 
And so it's like, so we've all been fooled. Nobody can speak for God. Nobody can do this. We've all been duped per se. And, and, and it's like almost giving reason is that trap of, 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 of the whole thing. It's, it's the trap of it all. Um, and that's always, to me, I always go back to this book because I'm like, it always explains like the state of so many predicaments that we have, even with like religious denomination, um, you know, kind of the whole question of evil that always gets brought up. Um, and, and we're so concerned with, with having a reason. Um, but like I always say, it's like, once you give a reason, you also give its unreason, you know, like when yeah. someone, when, when someone says like, oh, the reason why I love you is because so-and-so, right? And I always go, so you're saying if I wasn't nice, you wouldn't love me, <laughs> right? And when you say it like that, they start kind of like stepping back a little bit and fumbling. But that it basically is what we do with God too. Like, you know, the, the reason why I love God is because blah, 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 blah. But what if you didn't have those reasons? Would you still love God? Would you can you love God without reason in some ways? And yet still give a reason. I think I think this is the position that's so hard to hold for all of us is that oftentimes in our society we have to give a kind of reason. Right? This is inevitable, right? We I can never get I cannot get away with not giving a reason. But it's important to know, at least in my opinion, that when we give a reason we know it's not what captures it. It's not what it is. It's I have to give a reason because I have to express some type of form of love in some ways, right? Like when, when your partner asks, you know, you're like, what what's the you know, what are the reasons why you like me or you know, why'd you pick me or whatever? It's like answer the question, but don't reduce it to that reason. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. So that's the book of Job um, that you're oh, talking Job. about. Oh, okay, Job. Yeah. And um, I, I, this, it's probably my favorite book of the Bible. Um, and I, yeah, no, Job is like completely innocent. And, you know, his friends, again, like you said, trying, com, trying to completely be like, you did this, you did this, you didn't follow this law, you know. His wife tells him to curse God and die, which I think is so funny. She's just like so over his misery. She's just like, just get it over with. Right. And he refuses to do it. And, um, and yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. You know, when God gets to God's monologue, it's like, who set the parameters of the earth? Who lets the mountain goats run free? Who birthed this from their ice womb? All of these cosmic things absolutely no part of the monologue has anything to do with human beings. And I find that so fascinating um, that it's this thundering monologue that occurs that has nothing to do with Job or what happened to him or anything. It's just, mm -hmm. I exist of my own free will. And um, there's a liberation theologian uh, named Gustavo Gutierrez who writes about um, the book of Job. It's his book's called On Job. It's fantastic. But he really highlights that the book of Job obviously deals with theodicy, but it deals with even more so God's um, love of just gratuitous freedom, just absolute, just adoration of freedom, both of God's own freedom and of humanity's freedom as well. Um, and that God loves it. And this is how God created us was to exist just in freedom and, you know, that that extreme love, that it comes forth out of nothing but love, that that will attract us back, right? And so, it, again, you know, it just goes back to that completely just unfounded reason without reason, just like this level of, you know, I'm, I'm essentially, when it comes down to at the ground floor, I'm loved so much that I'm allowed to do whatever I want, to walk wherever I want, you know, but this is brought back in this sort of um, dependence upon the creator. Um, and that, 
all of it at the end of the day is not just about human beings, but is, is universal, you know, and that, and that God loves creation, you know, in, in tandem with humanity. Um, I, yeah, I, I really, yep. 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 It's a great book. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Job, I always, you know, the names I always get like. <laughs> That's a good was... little rascal too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I knew it. I knew it. I was like, I'm, I'm going to mess this one up. But you knew what I was talking about. So I was like, you know what? Even if I mess up a name. There we go. It's all right. It's, I do it all the time. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's, it's like the the job story is always like just a timeless timeless in my opinion just timeless position um to always reflect on um and it's funny because like this idea of, of of freedom i think this is probably the most hard concept to think about because as Christians and, and 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 people that have other religious kind of manifestations, uh, you know, we've always struggled with the question of like, well, you know, how come there's different religions? How come there's people that say God doesn't exist? How come there's people that say God does exist? How come there's people now that saying God our event, God is insistence, God, you know, this is I'm pulling from like Caputo here and um, the other French thinker that is, uh, I guess, a contemporary of Badu. Uh, Massignon or something like that. Um, but anyways, uh, this is the part that always fascinates me because we can say so many things about God. Um, <clears throat> and it's always been puzzling, but I, I think this is the part that's like, it's because of freedom, right? And I, I think some of the arguments that still hold today about this concept, it's like, you can't, if you didn't have freedom, then whatever love that is manifest wouldn't really be love if you didn't have the freedom to love in the first place, right? Because then if you don't have freedom, then it's not really love. It's just sort of like a sort of slave kind of thing. And then yet, ironically, Christianity does kind of um, use terms that have a kind of slave mentality right like submit to god and so on and so i think a lot of people have a hard time thinking through that yes. kind of like uh contradiction uh, in some ways like how do i think freedom but slavery but you need hegel to think this right <laughs> like that that's like that's like also my main gripe too is like hegel kind of addressed some of these things too about the whole yeah even master um the master's and, dependent yeah it's yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead yeah no no absolutely I, I i think that you know this this comes back to the importance of free will and acting as a free agent is you know we have the freedom to be courageous and we have the freedom to walk away um all of this in regards to faith is done completely out of our own volition. Um, and at every point along our faith journey, you know, we have a choice to make. Um, and that choice is only made out of freedom. Um, you know, the argument can be made that God demands everything of us and God demands nothing of us. Um, and honestly, I think going both routes, you'll end up at the same place, honestly. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think really and truly, like you said, you know, freedom undergirds our existence and through freedom or how, you know, we arrive at, you know, love, at faith, at, uh, relationality, all of these different things, and um, they must occur on a field essentially of, of freedom for them to take place because if they don't, then everything is predestined and we are just, you know, moving along on our chessboard, you know, for what's been programmed for us. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't quite align with scripture, with, you know, what we understand um, of God um, or our own faith as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, 
the the predestination thing, man, that's always been the the most difficult concept to unravel to just even like layman. Um, because you know, I remember when I was Muslim for a little bit, one of the things I heard was like this this Muslim guy goes, uh, he goes, So if everything's you know predetermined, right? He's like, why? He's like, why do I bother asking for forgiveness? He goes, God knows I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, right? Like he knows I'm gonna sin. He knows I'm gonna go to hell at this point. <laughs> you know, like if <laughs> if I'm already predetermined in this way, um, what's the point of all of this? Yeah. Um, and I've always been. This is where, like, for me, this is, is not a problem as the doctrine per se. It's more like the fact that we have this like a a thinking a equals a thinking that like we can't like undo you know it's so it's been such a mental habit now um that it's so difficult to entertain the the a b um logic of like yeah you're right you're predetermined but you're free <laughs> you know it's like and then like how is that how does that work and it's like well you know and then you can use a variety of arguments obviously but anyways what i've always enjoyed is actually boober's distinguishment between fate and destiny um where it's like there's there's almost like two opposing forces pulling you where it's like uh -huh. the point is to go through the obstacle and going through the obstacle is is your destiny but running away from the obstacle which you can't ever really run away from is is fate so Boober does like this really interesting move where it's like the obstacle is predetermined. You're right. You will face this obstacle, but how you frame your mode of being is what determines how it becomes fate or destiny and fate and destiny both carry a kind of like, if you do this, this is your predetermined state. Um, and I think that's like the, the other element of the conversation that's not sometimes brought up. Um, at least in this this Muslim uh, experience that I had, where it was like your frame of being really matters. It's not it's not that your frame of being doesn't matter and and doesn't influence the decision at the end if we want to take linear time, um, but your frame of being does matter and it can be the difference between fate and destiny. Um, and for Buber, it was the obstacle itself. And this goes into his critique about Kierkegaard because he avoided Regina or whatever. And he's like, he's like, oh, because he never married Regina. He never dealt with the obstacle. And so I, I'm still like, uh, I, I'm so torn because I love Buber and I love Kierkegaard. And so every time they have some type of disagreement between each other that I find, I'm just like, I don't believe it. I don't believe in the disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> best friend i don't believe this <laughs> oh that's so funny yeah no i mean i i absolutely you know i i i agree with that idea of a of a frame of being you know because how we encounter obstacles is going to be completely different depending on what point in life we're at you know what our our I mean, honestly, mode of being, what it looks like, you know, I mean, if you think back 10, 15 years, you know, to some foundational, you know, moment in your life, you know, would you have acted differently if you approached that experience today, you know, possibly, probably, um, you know, that I think that we know, you know, that there are going to be obstacles and conflict that are going to occur in our life. And, you know, I mean, that's a really, that's a really interesting way of thinking about it rather than sort of this like chaotic happenstance, you know, of just whatever this crazy web of interconnected, you know, things that sort of create this eventual obstacle that you encounter, that these encounters are almost predestined, but how you approach them and the you know the mode with which you get there and the decision that's made and how you move forward after the fact i mean that would all be dependent upon your free will as an individual and sort of how you're perceiving the world at the time um i don't have an answer but it's really interesting to think about <laughs> yeah <laughs> no yeah i agree it's uh 
it's funny because I was in a psychology religion class and we were debating free will and determinism. And um, I, my, my, my argument was that most of the time when people talk about free will, you're coming in with some type of connotation, some type of definition of it. And I was like, just because it doesn't work, right, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, and I was trying to explain to my class, like the class, I was like, it means that we have to redefine free will. It means that our current representation of free will doesn't actually correspond with what we are discovering, what we are understanding about the world. And so this means that we need to once again reconstruct what it means to be free. But that also entails a kind of freedom, doesn't it? You know, and like this, you know, and, and it's funny because like people are like, yeah, determinism. And I'm like, well, you know, you have to be kind of free to determine that determinism is the way, <laughs> you know, the fact that somebody has to convince me that determinism is the way <laughs> kind of shows that I have some type of freedom because they have to le legitimately depend upon my intellectual resources and try to sway me and convince me that determinism is the form of reality that we should partake in. And that always uh, stuns me because I'm just like, you know, this kind of proves that we have some type of freedom, some type of agency, um, because you wouldn't need to shove determinism down my throat if it was already determined, you know? <laughs> So you'd just be going through the motions. Uh, and, and that's why I always enjoyed Kierkegaard's um, position on, on choice, where he said choice is God is imminent within the choice. Um, but God also wants to be chosen. So he makes himself the product of your ability to choose. And then also the fact that he becomes a sort of actual object to choose. Um, in contrast to another um and and Kierkegaard is always saying you know god is the fact that you can choose is because of god <laughs> in this way you know so god is is imminent in this choice um and so freedom hope courage i mean this is all grounds that are really scary uh you know they're they're, they're really groundless when you start thinking about them and one of the things that kind of, I, I don't know if this is helpful, helpful for people, is um, what I liked about Kierkegaard, when he talked about real Christians, and this always gets a hot topic, the idea of real Christians. Um, Kierkegaard was obviously no, 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 did not care. Uh, he was like, yeah, real Christians must choose Christianity. And in some ways, I'm, I'm a little bit sympathetic to that view, mainly because it means that you you have thrown your existential ground at it, you know. And I and I think that's how I had a better relationship with Christianity. Is that my bitterness, my resentment, everything like that? That's a product of not being able to choose Christianity. I think, right? But when you do get to choose. It's a completely different relationship now. Um, and I think it's 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 something that, I don't know, I, I think that's something that maybe is talked about, maybe not, it's definitely not talked about enough in my circles, but the fact that we are determined, you could say, in the, the set social sphere, you know, you either get born Muslim or Jewish or whatever, but then there becomes a specific point in your life where you can choose. You can actually choose the thing that was already determined for you. And so this was like the ironic position of like the fact that not only as human beings, we condition things, but we uh, not only are we conditioned by things, but we also condition things um, in response. And yeah, there's so much there. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. You, you do enter into as an adult freely choosing. You know, you can, you can embrace, you know, what has been laid out before you, you can choose something new. It is, um, it is, it is freely chosen. And I think that, you know, again, that requires courage to do that. But 
I want to go back to that idea of, of, you know, sort of God being the product of the choice. Um, I really like that. And there's this idea, especially in process theology of um, sort of God as divine lure. So it's, it's God luring you forward, right? You are eternally sort of seeking after this, you know, this, I, I like to think of it as like a transcendent horizon, right? You are, you are moving towards this transcendent horizon. Um, and that is, could be representative of God wanting to be sought out, wanting to be chosen, wanting to be in relationship with creation. Um, that really speaks to that, you know, God's imminence in the choice, um, which, you know, I found the further that I get into Christianity, you know, the less and less I desire to make choices that I don't perceive sort of God's imminence in, right? They are right. not fulfilling in the way that sort of the God choice um, is fulfilling and, and spiritually enriching. Um, so I, I really think there's something there. But, you know, again, it depends on, you know, where you are in the journey. Like, you know, that you might not, you might be starting from a point where you don't perceive that one choice ha holds sort of the imminence of God in it. Um, but as a Christian, you know, freely choosing, freely embracing Christianity, you begin to sort of ask for this discernment um, to be following, you know, after this divine lure. Um, but again, no one is forcing you to do that. You know, it is just, it is, it is you seeking after what you desire, um, which, you know, is ultimately God. I mean, as far as I am concerned, all roads lead to God. So, you know, you just pick one and and go on, keep following it. <laughs> that That is the most courageous thing, though, ironically enough. You know, that 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 you pick something and, and you just you go on. Um, and I think that's the thing that we're so afraid of doing, you know, um, uh, we're afraid of making the wrong decision. I think mm -hmm. I think that is like the legitimate fear that we all have is making the wrong decision. We're always trying to discern, OK, we're assessing all the time, calculating every position every situation and um and this goes back to your concept of like a holy foolishness um of like yeah i don't i don't really know <laughs> but i'm gonna i'm gonna just choose i'm gonna just choose because that's the beauty of of also being a human being is is, is just choosing and we keep thinking like i guess we're so stuck on after the choice rather than the just the, the enjoyment of the choice um and this really feeds us and, and prevents us from making a choice in the first place um at least a real choice you kind of alluded to this idea of like a real choice because like not all choices have like god's product or imminence in it um you know it's definitely the difference between like picking strawberry milk chocolate milk. <laughs> you know like I don't think God is imminent in that choice. Okay, this is kind of like, this is just your hunger talking and, and so on. So this idea of like, what does it mean to really pick God um, is a really good question. Um, because I think a lot of people think picking God is, uh, granted, you have to start somewhere. Um, but I think a lot of people think picking God is picking what you're already brought up in so to speak. Mm -hmm. But picking is not restricted to that. Choosing is not restricted to that. And that's the part that we have to understand. And, and something that has also helped me is like, when I start to make choices now, I'm like, what part of me is actually making this choice? Yeah. Um, this is like, have been probably really life changing, uh, kind of like little experiment with myself where when I'm about to make like a really big decision, um, I find out that a lot of my fears and hesitations are not really predicated on myself. They're predicated on, you know, the way the world receives and, and interprets um, what you do, 
the your your interpersonal relationships, how others will perceive and and understand what you do, and it can be really uncomfortable. But when you strip those away, when you say, "Hey, if you didn't have any of these pressures, any of these influences, would you still pick this? Would you still choose this route?" And once I discovered that, I mean, I I think that kind of made it more clear for me that. Yes, I would. I would pick this. I would do it. Yeah. I would have the courage to pick it, if if I wasn't so afraid of this and this and this and this judgment. Um, I would pick it. And no, I don't know the the entire repercussions. I don't know because nobody else has picked it. <laughs> you know? um, at least when I'm talking about like more family matters, and I'm pretty sure you have probably similar experiences. Um, picking and choosing that probably like, you know, picking into the unknown, basically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, it's it's been quite an interesting learning process for me, um, having two kids and being married and understanding that as I make choices that they directly affect other people and you know, I try not to get too nervous about it because you can almost be, I mean, you could almost be paralyzed by fear, like making decisions that affect your children, because it's not just affecting you, it's affecting, you know, two other individuals um, and how they grow up. Um, but it's been, so, you know, there's a lot of levels of consideration for making decisions for me as a mom, but also it's been really rewarding teaching and watching my children make decisions for themselves and helping mm -hmm. them to understand, you know, that we do have freedom to make decisions and to sort of understand, you know, not just the immediate decision that's being made, but, you know, beyond that, what it looks like, what it looks like before the decision is made, understanding that you're taking sort of autonomy to make a decision how that decision might affect your life it's 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 a lot i mean it's a lot and we take it for granted because we make hundreds of decisions every single day and when we think back you know over the past five or ten years maybe only a couple of decisions stick out in our mind it's like whoa that was a turning point but in reality you know we're facing these sort of crossroads just over and over and over again um and sometimes we don't even realize it you know like you said you know i might pick chocolate milk or whatever it doesn't really matter but in reality, you know, we're making a decision. Are we making a decision to pray today? Are we making a decision to pray with our children? You know, are we making a decision to be kind to this person? Are we making a decision? You know, there's just so many things that then, you know, I try not to, because this can also be paralyzing for me to think about how this web of decision making then goes on and multiplies and multiplies um, because that gets too much and I get freaked out. Um, but you know, it, it has been interesting to watch small children come into their own autonomy of making decisions, seeing, you know, ramifications happen, even like just small, silly stuff, but it's still practice. It's still working towards, you know, these greater conclusions that will be made maybe later in life. Um, it's It's been really interesting, but, you know, the other part of it as a parent is seeing the immediate web of, you know, involvement in any decisions that are made. I mean, it's just been, um, yeah, I mean, it's not paralyzing, it's freeing because you're continually making a decision out of love. And, and I do ask myself that, you know, frequently I'm like, am I making a decision for myself or for others? Am I making a decision out of love or am I making it out of you know, this, that, or the other. And it, it greatly influences my decision-making process when I can directly see the people, you know, that, um, that are influenced by these decisions that are made. And, you know, again, when, when you, when you see that, you know, it's, a, it's both a free choice and it's also, you know, a courageous step to, um, making a decision out of love. Um, I think that that's, I mean, it's really been a, uh, a big lesson for me of, you know, I mean, before kids, maybe I was selfish or, you know, whatever, focused on making decisions. And it's been, um, it 
having children has expanded my understanding of of um of sort of this congregational living when it comes to christianity and 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 being um an invested member of a church body of a group of individuals etc i mean we are all so um deeply interconnected with each other just on levels that like we can't even fathom um and you know i think the decision making process and 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 choosing and and having choice and going after choices made out of love and towards you know god's eminence um really highlight that again relationality you know i mean it undergirds everything yeah yeah and this is where i always throw boober in because he's always about <laughs> relations um but you you brought up an interesting idea and maybe we'll kind of start closing off uh, around this area um because actually I, I really find this area fascinating i feel like this is probably area we probably could spend another hours talking about you brought up the concept of kids um a parent um this is something that i've always been really curious about um is how are you uh, obviously no right wrong answers um how are you how are you incorporating christianity um like as a, as a person that kind of you know knows and studies theology and you know um you probably you're probably you know obviously like probably wary and and and, and probably rightly so wary about the, the the dangers of you know your your kids being in a sort of congregational setting of, of church but then but then you also notice the discrepancy between the church and yourself because you also have that knowledge to sort of understand the discrepancy and you're also trying to basically do the mother thing where it's like you want your children to have a kind of faith a kind of understanding of religion and and, and kind of fall in love with it really um and then there's the discrepancy of of the church and, and what they say and and then what you're going to say to your kids and then probably what your husband says to to your kids and, and all this sort of stuff and yeah i'm just i know this is a hard question i know i'm so sorry that <laughs> i was not supposed to ask hard questions but no no i'm not gonna hang up <laughs> um no i'm glad you asked that because you know it's something that i wish i knew how other parents handled it right because you know my husband is also you know religious studies person and so um we don't have a good answer okay um it's really difficult like think back to when you were a kid in sunday school and like doing like an old testament you know whatever something from joshua or judges or something and uh and you're like oh yeah just draw the lion yeah and then like now as an adult you're studying in depth you know judges joshua you know all these things these incredibly violent experiences in the bible um that are traumatic and you're like they they conceptualized that how when i was a child you know there's no there's such a like radical disconnect between the two that um you know i i basically am leaving it at this i enjoy that my children like church life um they have you know we have a really good church that we go to um and it, it there's definitely a community experience so my children are exposed to you know a variety of individuals from all walks of life there's other kids there um you know their their grandparents are there um it's a really positive experience in that sense. Um, however, I'm kind of working, and this could always change in the future, but I'm kind of working from a perspective, my kids are young, they're seven and three, that they don't need extreme levels of biblical detail right now. Um, it almost might be off-putting. I want them to enjoy the experience um, and I want them to come to know God on their own terms. And, so that means sort of giving them the space to do that you know i i love praying with my children and i love having them in church it's a very non-dogmatic setting 
Um, Sunday school is very, you know, open-ended. And um, I feel that that is probably a good first step for us. I don't think, um, you know, we, as Protestants, we don't go through this formalized catechesis, right? It's sort of like just, well, we're going to figure it out, you know, as an individual or a congregation or whatever. And sometimes that's wonderful. And other times it's really difficult, right? And so I try to just leave space for my children to ask questions, ask big questions. You know, I thought it was so hilarious. Like a couple of weeks ago, um, my, my son runs in the room and he's like, Jesus, who's Jesus? And it's just like, I was laughing, like it was hilarious, but I'm also like, oh my God, how do I even answer this? You know? <laughs> so I, I feel like the best way I can do it is answer their questions, lead by example for them, me and my husband, and, um, and let them take the lead because really at the end of the day, it's, it's their own faith. It's an open door. I will not force them in any way. I will answer their questions. I will give them, you know, as they get older books, you know, but it's, um, it can be really disorienting for a child to understand what the hell's going on in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and maybe not everybody will agree with me on that and that's fine, but, um, I would like to ease my children into into the process with no pressure with just letting them be who they are because it's you know I, I think that when we when we force young people into you know these molds into these you know congregations whatever you know that can honestly create some religious trauma and if I can avoid that with my children, that would be wonderful because if they never have to go through this, you know, traumatic shift due to faith where they deconstruct, they reconstruct like we talked about, that that would be ideal for me. But I can't guarantee it, you know, but I will not pressure them. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps. <laughs> no, you know, no, that, 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 that's a, those are perfect answers. I mean, it's. Uh, th this is the this is the part that like has basically always haunted me in some ways because it's like <clears throat> I think you know as adults we can say you know yes we've we've done the work and we're still doing the work we're still deconstructing we're still reconstructing and um, but then it's like children you know children is like the children and, and interpersonal relationships I mean these are the most difficult uh, ways to you know, try to frame a, a kind of freedom without, you know, t taking it away, you know, and, and yeah, and, and it's so difficult. And, and that's something that's always bothered me. Like, I'm like, oh, how, how, I, how would I handle it if I did have children? You know, how would I go about this? And the only thing that I can lean on in some ways is uh, what my how my mother kind of adjusted to us as we got older. Again, my mom wasn't ex she wasn't knowledgeable like in theology in any sense she just kind of enforced the ideals you know like don't do this try to go to church and, and pray and um at one point i mean me and my brother didn't understand why we couldn't go outside on uh <laughs> the saturdays you know saturdays, yeah. <laughs> yeah we couldn't go out on saturdays and we had to stay inside and um you know, and my, I remember my mom teaching me. She's like, "Well, because the actual seventh day is 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 Saturday. It's the Sabbath." And, I, and I'm like, "Now I'm getting older. I'm like, I was basically raised Jewish in some type of ways." <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, and I, I I I keep thinking about this, but eventually my mom saw that me and my brother were growing more and more um, resistant. Mm -hmm. almost resentful in a kind of way to where I think the best response she did was that she kind of she didn't want us to lose that that element of religion whatever it was whatever it was left she didn't want that to be entirely thrown away or lost so she just kind of she gave such a general bare minimum for us yeah. at, the, at the end of the day she gave such a bare minimum for us and it was just purely out of love, 
um, I remember this. I think I was like in high school. My brother also started high school. He's like two years younger than me. And she just goes, look, guys, I, I, I'm not going to force you to go to church. I'm not going to force you to do this other stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to force you. The only thing I ask is you just have a personal relationship with God. You know, you pray, you know, that's all I ask. You just maintain that relationship, whatever way that you think that you need to maintain it, maintain it that way. And I remember hearing that as a child and it was like the most like relieving, yeah. like, like, oh, I'm so happy. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to um, abide by all these things so dogmatically. Um, and I really do think, and I will, I can still say that I can testify to this idea that me and my brother still have religious sentiments and connections that still remains today. And so I feel like there is a lot to be said with that idea, that idea of like just having the freedom to choose at the end of the day. Um, of course, with, you know, younger children, it's, it's always a little problematic because you have to give them some type of structure, some type yeah. of regiment, and it's not just like, okay, you know, like up hands, but um, yeah. And so in that sense, I think there is this progressive and process kind of like thing going on with children where, you know, you give them the kind of structure and then, and then you kind of allow them to, I guess, like you kind of said, just, you know, give them the space to ask questions and and really ponder around um i really like the idea you said before you said anger it leads to curiosity mm -hmm. i think it's yeah. it's i think it's so funny that even when i was thinking about when i was angry as a kid you ask a lot of curious questions ironically enough like why why is it like this why are you doing this why are you making me do this why you know it, it, anger and curiosity seem uh, at least when it comes to the frustrating level is very linked yeah you got to get past that impasse right yeah you have to resolve the conflict <laughs> all right so yeah i think i'll i'll just we'll we'll finish off um on a note of uh, for, for the last question of just what is your uh, aspirations and what is the kind of like, I know you said feminist theory is like something that you're very interested in. Um, but yeah, like what, what is it, what is something that you, you, I guess, link to your aspiration want to kind of like overcome or challenge or, or, or put into conversation, maybe that's the better term, put into conversation, bring this as a discourse that needs to be thought about and and so on. And so this can be a theological, this can be a personal, whatever it wants to be. Yeah, gosh, that's a big question. I think, you know, my, my number one aspiration is definitely, I mean, to be a good mom, you know, to, to do my duty as a mother um, and, and to do it well and to, to really help my children on their own faith journeys. I think, um, you know, I love theology and I, and I love doing all this, but I really think that helping my kids to the best of my ability is, is, I mean, it's, it's paramount in my life. Um, outside of that lofty goal um, of raising kids well, you know, I think, uh, as, as seminary has ended, I've, I've sort of reached this point where I'm trying to regroup, right? I'm done with the chaos of, of two years of grad school, and I'm trying to regroup and collect my thoughts. Um, I'm trying to come up with good ways to summarize in plain language what I believe to be true about theology and about the Christian faith. And you know, sort of in my head, it's like, gosh, I should probably, you know, start writing again and, you know, maybe turn this thesis into um, an approachable book. Um, 
I I think I'm reaching sort of like a summarizing phase, right? Before I go forth on new sort of like uh, theology journeys uh, and new avenues. But um, Trinitarian doctrine still looms large in my mind. I would love to find a way to to really hone in on the feminist theology side of things when it comes to the Trinity. Um, but I feel like I'm needing to close out this major chapter and maybe that means writing some more. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm at a closure and a, or a crossroads or a whatever opening a new door. I don't know. It feels good. I feel hopeful. Um, but I, I'm also really glad that school is behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, <laughs> I, I wish you know, I, I definitely envy your state, you know, the, the fact that you're done. You're done. You're almost there. Yeah, you know, you're, you're done. And yeah, I mean, I, I do have some a little bit of ways to go. But yeah, the I, I can't imagine that you are still trying to wrap your mind around because I, I've already started to begin like, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around. And I think it's possible that it's also kind of paralyzing all, a little bit. Yeah. Because it's like... You're like, okay, well, you know, these were my ideas before, and then there's this just big, just block of information that just encountered, and now you could say like you're almost basically you're at your reconstruction phase. Uh, reconstruction era. <laughs> reconstruction era. I, I want to start making memes where it's like, are they giving off that deconstruction energy or reconstruction energy? <laughs> Yes, absolutely do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's um, I'll be I'll be curious. I'll be I'll be looking forward to it. Do, should we expect uh, more theological fringe uh, stuff, or is this kind of a pause too? Or uh, no, I want to get back into it. I felt a little bit of guilt that I haven't had time for it, but getting the thesis published was like. Um, it was quite a process. And so um, now I kind of have my weekends back. So I'm hoping to get back to it at some point soon. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if this works for you, but like I typically use my videos as like, um, like ideas that I play with in the beginning. Yeah, exactly. Like a notebook. Yeah, like a, like a kind of like a notebook. I open like little video diary, and I'm just like throwing my thoughts out there. And not all of my thoughts, I end up writing them down after the video. But there's some ideas that they have such force that even after the video, I'm like, yeah, I need to write about that. I really yeah, do. I yeah. really need to talk about that and bring that up as a conversation. Um, and so that's that's kind of how I used my video platform as like my own. Uh, thought-provoking conversation. I don't know if you know OG Rose. Yeah, uh, I, I, do, I do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very close with them. They're super um, cool. They're so nice. Yeah, they're super nice. Um, and Daniel, um, Michelle's husband the, the, of the OG Rose, um, he does the net sessions uh, like every Thursday or something where like a group of thinkers like us kind of hop on and we just talk talking philosophy and stuff and kind of problems. But what I've noticed is that he always uses that material to like pump out like a super long article, like within the week. And it's about AI and the conversation. I'm like, wow. I mean, I mean, the man's like a machine, but yeah, I don't expect anybody else. I'm like, I honestly <laughs> suffer like, <laughs> like I'm pretty sure we we probably connect on the lines of just like yeah um time is a big problem <laughs> oh my gosh that's and, an understatement and, yeah and, 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 and like finding the, the 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 motivation after going through a complete exhaustion like as much as i like to read and i love to read um man it really gets me to the point of i hate reading oh i just want to do mindless things and then I get into this existential frustration where I'm like, oh, but I have these ideas that need to definitely be in the discourse of thought. Um, they need to be in the history of thought for somehow, you know, because 
uh, we need to propel some type of thought on this. Um, but anyways, um, I really look forward to anything that you do in the future, Rachel. I feel like it's, it's going to be spicy. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the label that I would uh, uh, label it. You know, I see a lot of your memes on Instagram. Super spicy. Love it. <laughs> You're, 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 you seem unapologetic in, in the way that you are. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, um, re which I really enjoy. I, I, you know, I always had a fun time talking to you about, you know, just on Instagram about like little frustrations about, you know, denominations and what people read and what people don't read. And, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I love it. I'm, I'm glad that we've been able to connect and I'm, I'm, um, Yes, I'm I'm rooting for you on on finishing your stuff and moving on to the next chapter and doing awesome stuff and you know I think that the theologians and philosophers that you're choosing, you know, to kind of work off of or grade A, I'm I'm super stoked for you. So, um yeah, no, I'm I'm super thankful that we're able to connect and share memes and chit chat and it's um yeah no i'm i'm really like i'm really thankful for the greater like network of like you know post liberal post christian post whatever kind of like instagrammers that we've been able to find it's really nice actually i'm glad there's other folks out there <laughs> yeah no same yeah I've, I've been really enjoying it it's it's actually one of the very things that like gave me hope in christianity again yep the fact that it's it's not a static conversation anymore. It's so alive, um, filled with a lot of hostility. But you know, you can do that mean move where it's like hostility, you know, like happiness, like yes, hostility, uh, uh, because it, it means it's alive. It's 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 filled with promise, hope, and uh, I like I like the state actually. It's it's so interesting to me, and I think this is what pulled me again, and I feel like. I feel like you probably saying the fa uh, the same enthusiasm is that the conversation didn't stop. There's so much that we have to unpack, uncover. Um, we're not talking about mundane things like what does this Hebrew word mean in whatever in this sentence. We're, we're we're also tackling huge concepts. Trinity. What does it mean? Who is Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. All the hard hitting stuff, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <sighs> okay. All right. So once again, thank you, Rachel, for being here. I think it was super enlightening having you. Um, loved hearing your takes on freedom, hope, courage. Um, really enjoyed your takes on, you know, the ethical concerns that you end up coming across and um you know being a mother raising children all the different personal relations that you have to deal with um this kind of really shows that we we can't separate these realms that much you know they they definitely feed into each other and influence each other and and so you being a mother is you doing theology you know <laughs> like it, it seems like it's you it's you doing that you're doing theology when your kid says, who's Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. But, all right. So thank you guys for watching. And uh, you guys can find Rachel. She has a YouTube channel, Theological Friends. Again, obviously, I'm hoping that she gets back on. Um, but you can also find her on Instagram. I believe you're in, your handle is your full name, right? Yeah, it's just Rachel Grace Blanton. Yeah. And exploring yep. the theological fringe is my Instagram too, but I don't ever use it. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you guys can find her there and I'll try to, I'll, I'll put the links on the YouTube when I make it. Um, but yeah, it was, it was so great talking to you, Rachel. Um, and yeah, me probably, too. I'm pretty sure Michelle will reach out to you from OG Rose. She will snipe you. She will snipe you because uh, I love her. So I'm looking yeah, forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, she's great. She, she's she's like I, I consider to be like one of my best online buddies. Um, we've done a lot of interviews together uh, with other people. So she will definitely snipe you for the the mother conversation, and I think you guys will enjoy it. 
Yes, awesome. I think Deb will enjoy it. She will. I, I'll probably even push her to do that with you. Um, and, and, yeah, because she ready. those conversations. Um, but all right, I'm gonna stop the recording. I think <laughs> if I can. <laughs> all right.